Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Broom, and we've been talking about the Old Testament calendar. Today we're going to look specifically at Rosh Hashanah, um, the New Year celebration with the trumpets and the seventh month and the first month and why that's so weird and confusing, etc., etc., so why is it so weird and confusing, Greg? <laughs> I don't know if it's all that weird and confusing. As you said last time, we are used to having a calendar year and a fiscal year and a school year and who knows all what else, anniversaries, birthdays. We, we count years from all sorts of starting points. Uh, the original Hebrew calendar began with the day of creation, which appears to have been the autumnal equinox, some 4,000 years before Christ was born. And and stayed like that. It's the, it's also that that first New Year's Day, which was really the new the birth of the world, was also the same day that Noah opened up the ark and looked out on his new world. So it's a, we're building some momentum here. What threw it askew or perfected and, and unfolded it, depending on your perspective, <laughs> was uh, Passover. God comes to Moses and says, this month will begin, will be the beginning of months to you. It was the seventh month, which is to say the month that begins with the vernal equinox. So the whole calendar got shifted seven months. And on top of that, all of the liturgical feasts started from Passover. And so we have Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which runs uh, contemporaneously with it. We have of the waving of the first fruit chief, which takes, also takes place at the same time. And then 50 days later, uh, Pentecost or first fruits. And then in the, what has now become the seventh month because of this huge shift, we have the original New Year's Day, which was celebrated as trumpets, what the Jews today call Rosh Hashanah, the first of the days or the, the chief of the days. And then was followed quickly by the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and by Sukkoth, uh, Feast of Tabernacles or in gathering. So God, in order to elaborate on the on the Sabbath theme, draw some things together, restructured the calendar so it would begin with Passover, with redemption rather than creation. So there's there's less than there. And that it would all fit into seventh month, seven months. And the seventh month would get three feasts to emphasize, wow, the seventh month's really a, a liturgical month. Lots, lots of good stuff's happening here. And now we come to the idea of new moons. I, I said something last time that at the time I thought I was right about, but then you asked the, the obvious question that made me say, wait. <laughs> uh, and that had to do with how do you recognize a new moon since there's nothing there? <laughs> um, it turns out that there is something there. A new moon is defined as the first slightest sliver uh. of a crescent. I have to so it is looking up. for a new beginning of something. It's not looking for the absence of something. Right. So okay. they actually, they I, I, I don't know where I read this, but someplace having to do with such things, they would watch very diligently in about Jerusalem to from hilltops and such to see when somebody could actually see the moon. Because it's a cloudy, that's kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it was, if someone saw it, they would you know, light the, Lord of the Rings style, right? Light the uh, the torch <laughs> the on the top of the mountain. Lit. <laughs> the beacons are lit, and, and word would go out that this the new moon has in fact been announced. And uh, Passover and the cutting of the first fruit sheath and all of that goes forward from there. And it's all packaged in those seven months. And nobody put any feasts in the other months until we get to um, the Book of Esther and the Feast of Purim, which is outside of what I'm prepared to talk about, but. It was not part of the original plan, and that's and it's as we're coming near the time of the Gentiles that that even happens. In fact, it's a Gentile emperor who kind of imposes it. <laughs> so, some things we can talk about just briefly, and, and you know, you don't know how much you're insulting your audience by pointing out some obvious things, <laughs> like days. It's the time the Earth turns on its axis. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that, but for all practical purposes, that's what it is. A year is the movement of the Earth around about the sun. But visually, if you're in an agrarian society and you're out there farming or watching a sheep, 
day after day, month after month, year after year, you will note that at some point, and we still do this when we're driving to work. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're driving down that street and everything's fine. And like a month later, suddenly the sun's in your eyes and it's the same time. Where'd <laughs> yeah. that sun come from? <laughs> yeah. Because the sun is rising a little bit different every day. Um, and there will be a point when it'll be right where you don't want it to be and then it will move on. And, and then it will come back later on. Uh, it will go from an extreme northern point on the horizon to an extreme southern and then come back again. And so if you wanted to mark the year, that would be it. You, and so it is possible for human beings without having to step outside of planet Earth to have a good conception of what the year looked like. The question I've gotten from teenagers over and over again is, but what about the week? <laughs> God made the week in Genesis 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but how did we get it? God made it in Genesis 1. No, I know that. But but how do we have it? It hasn't stopped. It hasn't then and stopped. Now. <laughs> yeah. Jews celebrated it. Christians picked it up. The Christian West uh, carried it on. And it's gone in a straight line from then to then. It is the one thing that has no astronomical reference point. It is. It has a historical reference point. God did it. God set the pattern. And so uh, we have the, uh, the seventh day and we have the new moons. And uh, each, new, each new moon was announced. Since I got off track, I'm going to come back to this. Each new moon was addressed or was announced by the blowing of trumpet. So this is um, paralleled or, or unfolded, developed, whatever the literary word should be. In the book of Revelation, we come to, uh, after the opening of the sealed document, we come to seven trumpets. And we're, we're to recognize seven trumpets, seven festival months, each announced by the blowing of a trumpet. So again, Revelation is a liturgy. It's a worship service unfolding where the pastors are the angels blowing the trumpets and, and you know, not not that the church is supposed to, to keep the Old Testament festivals, but using Old Testament language shows what the pastors are doing, which is to call for God's victory and God's judgment in their prayers and preaching. And then we come down to the seventh trumpet. I will read that one. This is from Revelation chapter 11. Um, and it says, The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now the hallelujah chorus is playing in the background. <laughs> and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come the time of the dead that they should be judged, that is, avenged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth, or the land. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. So this is the last biblical reference, that I'm aware of at least, to Rosh Hashanah. It's, it's this coming of Christ's kingdom in the first century as God smacks down apostate Israel and smacks down Rome and reveals the kingdom of Christ in all of its glory. And it's all about Rosh Hashanah imagery, the seventh trumpet, the covenant making language of lightning and voices and thundering that we saw originally at Mount Sinai, the Ark of the Covenant appearing, the, the praise to God and the call for judgment. And so this, this can help us give us um, some ideas of what Rosh Hashanah was about in the first place. Because the Bible doesn't do a whole lot with it. It just says, okay, this was the day the world was made. Well, you know, let's stop and think about that. There was a day the world was made. There was a day the world was made. Weren't there six? There was a day when heaven and earth were created. And then six days that God formed and filled. And then a seventh day in which he rested. But my point is that it's a short temporal sequence uh, beginning with one particular day. And it's not a process of millions of years. Hmm. Some churches, I, do, I don't know if the OPC does this at all in our church, we regularly recite the Ten Commandments. And it, it, it does say something when you get to the Fourth Commandment. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all of them is, and the seventh day. 
you know, it's, it's that, that's constantly in your face. It's a lot harder to give up six day creationism when, you know, every week or every other week or every month, you're confessing that this is truth. And when your New Year's Day says this, this isn't, it's not just that this is happening now. This has been happening for X number of years, which we actually can count without going to scientific notation. It, 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 is a, it is a relatively small number in the thousands that marks off how history has advanced from that original creation through the flood. And again, Noah's uh, escape from the flood is, is another thing that's marked here. So we're given not process, but this festival teaches us a God who acts into history, a God who initiates history, a God who comes back and acts dramatically in history. We're not even talking about his daily providence. We're just talking about this is a God whose daily providence does not seal him out of history. Um, and, I, and I think this is, let me ramble for a second here. I was a teenager when I first heard a sermon by uh, R.J. Rush to me on the providence of God. And for me, it was life shaping because I had always been taught predestination and all that. And I believed it all. I don't know if I'd always been taught it, but I'd been taught it long enough that I, I believed it and understood it. But I think I had fallen into the same trap that I think a lot of Calvinists do. God predestined everything in the beginning. He sort of planned it and wound it up like a clock. And then he just lets it tick because his plan is perfect. And why? I mean, yes, of course, he programs in his miracles. But aside from that, <laughs> the laws of Newtonian mechanics take over. And, you know, there, because of that, there are some things you really shouldn't pray for. For instance, you, you can pray that someone can get over a cold because we know that can happen, but that someone can recover from cancer. No, you don't pray for that, really. You just pray that they'll be comfortable. You don't pray for things that seem miraculous or, or, or such because we're past, the, we're past the time of sign gifts and sign miracles, and we get the idea that God, God's locked out. And I think this, this is a... Um, it's certainly not what the Westminster Confession teaches. Mm -hmm. um, that God is able to act through means, beyond means, without means. And the, and the verb tense there is, is in the present. He is able to act. He does act. And, and this is something that the calendar is pointing us to. God continues not only to govern the world, but he can stop everything and do something so dramatic that we stand back and say, whoa, he can get our attention. And so by tying it up to the Re book of Revelation, the coming of Christ's kingdom in the first century, and then ultimately the coming of Christ at the end of history. These are all things that this, this festival is pointing us to. The God who comes in glory and judgment to rescue his people, to set things right, to intervene in their mundanity, and to change the world and shake it up. And so, God, let people go around and blow horns that day. <laughs> This, this reminds me of something that my pastor is preaching on a few, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago now, where God sets up this regularity in nature. And it's something that he upholds moment by moment, and he delights to do this. Right. But that same regularity is often what scoffers look at to say, well, Look, everything continues as it has been since the fathers. <laughs> yes. well, you think that the world's going to end? Well, <laughs> there was this one very dramatic event <laughs> called the flood yeah. where God did that. And after, after he did that, he, he reshaped the world. And yeah. even the calendar, like you said, the, there's the, the New Year Day uh, that is now recognized when Noah came out of the ark. and everything shifts and he then promises i will not destroy the earth with a flood but that same god still says the earth will be rolled up like a scroll and the heavens shall be consumed with fire yeah he promises that everything will remain the same until the end it will remain the same until it won't because <laughs> it's all because it's all in his hand it's not it's not something where god pushed play on the program key and then has to come back later and say, oops, interrupt. We're done here. It's He's constant. I like the way he said it. He's constantly upholding personally. I don't remember the exact words you said. But moment by moment. Moment by moment, yeah. Yeah. 
And, and, I, and I think too often that the, the Calvinists miss this. And in fact, I remember doing a, a Bible study like this in, in a church one day, and I got an elder kind of in my face saying, now, what, now wait a minute, what are you saying? And I backed up and said it again more slowly and clearly and succinctly and said, oh, okay. But it's also been a paradigm shift for a lot of people. Um, I remember doing that same kind of lecture in ACI, ACSI conference. It was in a lecture I call Fairies and Photons, and I spell fairy the correct way. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I got, and I got, a, I got a lot. It was fairly early in the morning, and I got a lot of young people there, probably twenty to thirty people. And I and I asked them how many of you came because I spelled fairy this way. And they, like two thirds of the hands went out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as as I taught through this again, I, I I got confusion on both sides. There were those who who understood that God controls everything. But they had let it wander into kind of a deistic, Newtonian, mechanical uh, uh, approach. And then there were others who, God controls everything? I mean, death and sin and all that? I remember, I think it was one young man who just really, that was revolutionary to him. He wasn't hostile. It was just, so how does this work? And what does this mean? And and so I had to go back to, to basic principles, uh, quoting scripture off the top of my head so, you know, I'm not, we're not even getting into predestination here. We're just talking about God's sovereign rule of the universe, mm -hmm. from which, of course, predestination is just a simple step. But wasn't, I wasn't trying to do, even do that. I was just trying, you, you need to have confidence that God's in control, especially mm -hmm. as a science teacher. So this was for, for science teachers. We, can't, we don't want the impersonalism of Baal worship, where nature is just a series of interrelated forces that we try to placate or man, manipulate or maneuver. Uh, with our magic, but neither is um, neither is God flipping a coin from time to time, trying to just figure out what He's going to do next while He wrestles with an, with the universe. God is telling the story. The, the uh, I, something else you said it reminded me of um, G.K. Chesterton uh, in the book Orthodoxy, the uh, Ethics of Elfland, I believe, is the chapter where he says that you know ch children have a an infinite taste for anything fun. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. And he says, our father is older, is younger than we are. He <laughs> does not grow weary. He he watches the sunrise and says, wow, that is so cool. Do it again. <laughs> for 6,000 years because he delights in it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, what is it? It's not, not a, um, not automation, but an encore mm -hmm. that gets repeated <laughs> thousands of times because God delights. Yeah. You can see the temptation, especially for scientists to get the, the cart before the horse because mm -hmm. their daily work depends on the assumption that tomorrow's going to work like today worked, that, yeah. that everything's going to be the same to an extent. So I've talked to a number of professional scientists who are Christians, not Christian scientists, but yeah, scientists it. who are Christians. <laughs> who you always have look that qualification. Back, um, <laughs> uh, who maybe aren't quite on board with six day creation. Mm -hmm. And it's it's because things look really old according to the assumptions that they're, you know, working yeah. with. And it's like, yeah, I can see why you would think that? Because every single day you go in and assume that the tools you have are going to be sufficient for the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. forgets that there was a day when it had to start and it had to be different. And there's going to be another day that's going to be different. Yeah. And it's that, that discontinuity that mm -hmm. is essential to the Christian faith. Uh, if we only have continuity, we're stuck with Baal worship. And there's no way out of the machine. But at the same time, we need God to to deal in regularity, or we, we, we can't even go plow a field or plant a garden. Who knows what will happen, what the weather will do, what the rain will do. What if rain is actually poison one day and health giving the next? Well, if we don't know these things, we don't have a degree of certainty that seasons will come and that gravity will pull things down and that thermodynamics works. And these are the very things that, that um, God guaranteed to Noah after the flood. While the earth remaineth, uh, cold and heat, day and night, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, these things will not cease. 
Uh, and as you look at the list, it basically has to do with thermo cold and heat, thermodynamics, which is the foundation of physics and chemistry, and all the astronomical things, the Earth spinning on its axis and spinning around the sun, and um, the, how the growing seasons, the biological processes are tied into all that. God says, I'm going to keep doing this. Doesn't mean I might not tweak it now and then because it's fun <laughs> and I have some I have a point to make, but that's not going to interfere normally with your ability to exercise dominion in this world. And so we, we need the regularity, but if all we have is regularity, then we have meaninglessness. We are yeah. stuck in a machine. And even when even when God does subvert the regular acts and order of providence, the message that we should take from that is not, wow. God is so Herculean that even he can <laughs> wrestle against the forces of the universe and come out on top. It's more like, yeah, God is so great that it's it it doesn't take any effort. He's just like, yeah, that 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 happened now. <laughs> <laughs> so many of the liberal scholars of the past generation tried to uh, read Genesis in terms of the Tiamat myth, uh, Mar <laughs> Marduk wrestling with the chaos monster to to bring order and uh so that's what we see in genesis 1 it's a it's a it's a memory of uh, the babylonian legends of god now transformed out of being marduk or some polytheistic pantheon into being this one lone god who has struggled with chaos and there's just this little reference left to it about the earth being without form of void and and now god has successfully brought order no <laughs> no not, not not remotely that's not it's not even like even if you acknowledge that there's some chaos after the creation moment where he, you know, he speaks and the heavens and the earth are there. Even then, there's no struggle involved. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. the The spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters, and then he goes, "Um, I want land there," and the land <laughs> comes up out of the water. Yeah, and that's it. There's no, there's no God going. Oh, I gotta really fight for this. It's just yeah. um, <laughs> land. B. Yeah, you can yeah. squint your eyes and turn down the lights, and creation still doesn't sound like the Tiamat myth. <laughs> <laughs> for one, it's written better. <laughs> right, like that's the thing that gets me about all the pagan myths. It's like this isn't even like enjoyable. Like, I've I have met one person who really enjoyed genuinely enjoyed the Epic of Gilgamesh and it's like their favorite thing to read. And I'm like, I don't okay. understand that. But okay. <laughs> I mean, no accounting for taste. I mean, well, it, it, it's something good, I guess, that the only, the only really enjoyable pagan myths to me are the Norse myths. Mm -hmm. Which more than likely have were influenced by Christianity by, yeah. breaking into the region. <laughs> all the extant many manuscripts, the Norse Edda, the Prose Edda, are all from a century, three hundred years after missionaries right. made made it into the the Nordic tribes. Right. Yeah. Where were, were we? How did, how did we get here? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, you were you were talking about um, Gilgamesh. The one exception, the one time I do enjoy Gilgamesh is when Patrick Stewart, Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> tells the story in the midst of Darmok. And uh, people yes. out there don't know what that's all about. See if you can find it. It's actually kind of hard to find anymore. Unless you oh. the whole set. So I should not put it in the show notes and spoil it forever. Uh, I don't know. Because mm -hmm. if I put it in the show notes, then they'll know exactly where to find it. Okay. Well, if you can, if you can find it, it's not, it's not easy all the time. So this let, let's let's move toward a, uh, a a point. As I told you all earlier, this was originally an essay for for New Year's, and we're pretty close to New Year's right now. So we've been at this for not quite a year, just over uh, a year. Over a year, mm -hmm. okay. And and so this brings up the question of January first. What good is that? Not much. It's purely arbitrary. <laughs> Um, it, there's no, it has no astronomical connotations, very few cultural ones, except that we've been doing it for a long time. It's, it's slid, New Year's Day has slid back and forth across the Roman and Roman Catholic calendar a good deal too. But there, there does seem to be something instinctive to realize that there's something about a year, the completion of a year, that calls for thought, meditation, self-searching in Israel, Rosh Hashanah fell just before the Day of Atonement. 
And so the celebration that God is coming and he's knocking hard were, was to summon God's people to fast and to pray and to repent and to prepare their hearts for God's judgment upon them. We, uh, we have a vague sense of this, but very vague. Well, let's say New Year's is for new starts and making good resolutions and changing patterns and habits and losing some pounds and buying a gym membership, <laughs> which that will gyms... last for 12 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The gyms love this because they can give you all kinds of deals knowing that they will never have to come across with any of it because you won't either. But th this, this is all largely Pelagianism. Man can remake himself. Uh, by his efforts, by his choices, by his um, self-pledging of to do good. And um, the newness is it's self-regeneration. Whereas the Bible points to God is the one who regenerates. God who brings in a new kingdom from outside of history, and from outside of creation. Uh, it's the kingdom of heaven. It comes from heaven and from the throne of God. And it comes in the person of the Son of God, who is not merely a creature, although he became a creature in the in, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. God invaded our history and God came to save us and to turn our history around. And now he reigns from heaven to save his people and to advance his kingdom. And the power to change is his. He pours forth his spirit through his word, through his gospel. And our job is to respond with obedience and with worship uh, and to call for the coming of his kingdom. May your kingdom come, your will be done. So resolutions, eh. <laughs> but uh, a time to search one's heart, to search and try our ways and to return to the Lord, to lift up our hearts with our hands to the God of heaven. This is as good a time as any to do such things. Mm -hmm. Any experience with New Year's resolutions, either of your own or people you know? Yeah, I actually love New Year's and love being intentional about how the New Year's going to go mm -hmm. uh, or how I want to grow in the next year. I mean, obviously I have no control over how the year actually goes, but I have control over me. And so I want to be intentional and always growing in intentionality in what I'm doing. Um, so I have lots of different resolutions. Like last year I did actually finish the, uh, the Bible in a year for the first time and I'm doing that again. And I took Brian's suggestion of doing the five year plan at the same time. Oh. I was listening to an interview on the Art of Manliness podcast where he talked about somebody had written a book about the the power of starting at auspicious moments. Like if you're mm. going to try something new, there is actually some statistical correlation between starting on the first of a month or the first of a year or even the first of a week that you're more likely to stick to it, uh -huh. which I think is really interesting. and. The, the point of the book was sort of take advantage of this. Know that there's this momentum that you can build yeah. because of this. But yeah, that's my thoughts. I have lots nice. of New Year's resolutions. <laughs> They're still going. <laughs> well, and for me, similarly to like what, what I think is so useful with, with doing a year plan and a five-year more in-depth study plan is uh, in addition to having... Um, resolutions for a year and really i do think that the biggest problem with new year's resolutions is that we all go too big because mm -hmm. we're all like yeah. i want to learn 47 new languages and <laughs> uh weigh 40 pounds less and <laughs> uh go to the moon and <laughs> rest the bear and all this stuff that you know you're never gonna do all of that in yeah. one year and you you start off with some really good momentum and it's once you get a little bit into that that the slog hits and you realize oh no this is a horrible I'm, I'm making horrible progress on this for the year it's like there's no way anymore. i can make it up it's yeah. not it's not fun it's not exciting it's not personal development you should have some realistic year long goals yes. i think um for instance read the whole Bible in a year if you haven't. Or for me, for instance, be moved out of California. <laughs> <laughs> but like in the short term, you you should have monthly goals, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's something that feeds into the overarching year goal or something else that you want to develop. So 
I, th I, th I don't think it was on Art of Manliness. It was on some other kind of platform like it, though, where, where they were talking about this. And it's like, you should have goals for the month so that you can go, okay, you know what? That's That deadline's coming up quick. It's a lot quicker than 365 days. <laughs> and I, that means I got to get on it. And so you can get on it and you start – that's what builds the real momentum is a month-by-month stepwise motion. Mm -hmm. That was my music major coming out with that term. Flies <laughs> um, motion. Oh, I but use. but I really, can read that. <laughs> but really, so like just doing doing minimal steps first mm -hmm. really helps you build momentum. It's the same thing on a daily scale. Like the best thing you can do is tackle the smallest stuff first, because then you start feeling, hey, I'm actually getting stuff done. Yeah. Uh, because if you mm -hmm. if you tackle the biggest thing first. In your mind, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, it's going so slow. I'm never going to get through the eight <laughs> things on my list because this yeah. first one's taken four hours already, even though the other seven will only take the other four hours total. But if you do the first, the last seven first in four hours, then you're like, wow, I've been doing so great. I can tackle yeah. this big thing now. Yeah. It's Dave Ramsey's debt snowball for everything. <laughs> yeah. But like the, the point of all this, you know, people talk about New Year's resolutions and I always hear a little bit more murmuring about Jonathan Edwards' resolutions around New Year's Day. And I'm like, oh, please, no. Um, just because the point of the resolution isn't to sanctify ourselves, except insofar as we are, again, being intentional about how we want to serve God. It's not about making ourselves more perfect. God does that. Um, it's not about winning more favor day by day with God and, you know, making progress and gaining momentum in how holy we are. It's about increasing in faithfulness and being intentional about serving God. And it's because of Christ. It's serving Christ who has already sanctified us and who will perfect us at the last day. The um, thing that you're both describing is basically a schedule. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, that's the There's word. People, people hear that, and, and they're not happy because schedule seems burdensome. But you know, you talked about learning foreign language. If you're in a class that has a schedule that meets X number of days a week for X number of months, there's a good chance after two or three years you might actually know another language. Mm. But if you leave it to yourself to read a little bit here and there and do Duolingo whenever you can. Probably not. <laughs> Just I, I have been using Duolingo, <laughs> except that I do it every day, so it actually has helped. But that's because it's every day. It's, yeah, you, you've got it scheduled. You know, uh, and a lot of these things are just committing yourself to a schedule. This is a schedule of Bible reading or prayer time, or developing some gift that you think God has given you, and that you could be using more effectively if you knew more or practiced more or whatever. And, and, and we're making a schedule. We can make it as as repetitive or as drawn out or as hard-nosed or as blasé as we want. But if we have some kind of schedule, that, and again, it's, it's not like we, we don't have to take an oath before God. I will do all of these things on the schedule. <laughs> we can change our minds later. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is helpful. You mentioned um, starting points. I got uh, a new Bible when I turned 16. My parents bought it for me and uh, our friend Vic Lockman, who was a Christian cartoonist, did the engraving in the front. So it was very mm -hmm. special. And I was 16. And the next day I started reading the Bible. I had tried, I do not know how many times before to read the Bible. And I had never made it past the first several chapters of Genesis. But that was the first time I kept going and I made it through one year. Once I had done it one year and had disciplined myself to one year, then I could do it again. And I kept on going. Uh, interrupted a little bit when I got married because I did not discipline myself. But then by my wife's example, I came back and got back on top of it. And still, it's basically two chapters a day. It's not all Bible study I do, but it is a good habit that God can use. And it certainly doesn't earn any brownie points with God. But it might be something that God will be pleased to use now and then. Nothing else. I'll, it's better than the alternatives of wasting time. <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier in the episode, God uses means and goes beyond means and goes without means, but he's he's promised to bless the use of his word. Mm -hmm. And it's 
it's not a good habit in pretty much any sphere that you're you'd care to name to rely on the extraordinary as yes. your example yeah you know there's a um, a chapter coming up i think it's in joshua so it's after we leave the, the torah but i i think i titled it analog versus digital <laughs> with regard to covenant living the the analog uh, or the digital is one two three bang god did something four five <laughs> six seven eight bang god did something Whereas the analog is, God is constantly at work here, and you may not notice it because it's so smooth. And oh wow, look, that was real. Okay, we're going back here. And you know, um, <laughs> when you when you live with the fact that God's always at work, mm-hmm. and the spikes come, and, and we should certainly never despise them. There are, there are reformations, there are um, Whit- Whitfield revivals, uh, Welsh revivals. You know, you pick it, mm-hmm. but mostly God works in us in small ways day by day as we establish within our home life for our family patterns of obedience that are productive not not superstitious there's there's a a danger in in the superstitious uh it can easily become legalistic and moralistic but if we can still see okay there is a point here you you, you probably both heard of the of the lady who um is showing her daughter how to cook a ham and she cuts off (laughs) Yeah, she cuts off both ends, and the daughter says, why do you do that? Well, that's because my mom always did that. Um, mom, why, why, why did you always do that? Well, that's because your grandma always did that. Grandma, why, great-grandma, why, why did you do this? Well, because when we were first married, all I had was a pan that was this big, so we had to cut <laughs> off the ham to make it fit. So, some habits and customs need explanation and need to be gotten rid of. Uh, that one makes me right. extra sad because the end of the ham is the best part. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Why there would anyone know. cut it off? <laughs> but there's there's a point in in the small changes and the small growths, and um, my generation particularly, and, and probably on into yours. Uh, I came at the tail end of the sixties when everything was about you know getting high and being explosive and exciting and changing the world and turning it upside down, even violently. And the whole and the music was like that too. We expected everything to happen big time, lots of lights and, and special effects and all of that. And we expected the Holy Spirit to just come in dramatic ways. <coughs> and the idea of you no, know, get married, get a job, start raising your children for Christ, just seemed kind of well. Jesus is coming back any minute. Why would we do those things? Uh, and it, it took a while for people to figure that one out. And Jesus, in fact, did not come back. <laughs> Yeah, well, shall we wrap up with some recommendations? Um, I'm going to go first because it segued from what we just talked about is one of our New Year's, I'm just going to call them intentions, although that has Catholic connotations. (laughs) um, One of the things we decided to do at the start of this year in our house is David and I decided we wanted to have more fun with dinners. I've mentioned before that I really don't particularly enjoy cooking David does, but he doesn't have the same time flexibility that I do. So I'm the one who cooks, even though I don't like it. But we decided we wanted to have more fun with meal planning and drink more wine. That was our <laughs> New Year's resolution was drink more wine. So, Good Calvinist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, for me, it's a lot of fun because I enjoy beverages of all sorts, um, coffee especially. But to me, adding that element of, all right, what wine is going to pair with this dinner mm-hmm. made it so much more fun. So now I I set my grocery budget and I set my wine budget and I <laughs> go into the store and I find something that has the right descriptors to go with what I'm going to make for dinner. And that's below the dollar amount that we've set. And it's a lot of fun. So I recommend wine pairings and meal planning. I'm going to recommend... Uh, an old, it's not quite a video game, although it involves, I guess, a computer game. It's called You Don't Know Jack. Have you ever heard of it? We had it on like my first, my family's <laughs> first computer. I didn't know yeah. what it was, but yeah, I, I remember I, we I, had I it. I think it's still accessible. There are there are multiple variations and extensions that go way beyond it. But I, having had to play or watch some of them played recently, I still like this version best. It is, as the um, intro suggests, a common, it's where 
pop culture and high culture clash. <laughs> um, and you, you have to know something of both in order to score. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. I mean, this is not one of theirs. This is one I made up along those lines. But if Oedipus Rex were to be rewritten using villains from DC's Batman, which two villains acting as a team would be appropriate? Which two of Batman's villains would be appropriate to play the villain in Oedipus Rex? Actually, it's not Oedipus Rex. It's the Oedipus myth to be... Okay. To go back so the whole, the whole cycle? Yeah. Is, is the Riddler one of them? Yep. And given who tells the riddle, the other one would have to be... Is, is there a Batman villain named the Sphinx? <laughs> <laughs> no, Catwoman. but there is... Catwoman. Oh. Is. So it's that kind, that kind of stuff yeah. where you have to read. Though, really, it. isn't the villain in Oedipus Rex... Oedipus. Oedipus. Oedipus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> like, right. What villain are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. In the grand tradition of Greek theater, it is everyone is a villain. <laughs> yep. Yeah, to be sure. For my recommendation, I'm going to go a bit more bleak because it's really the only thing I can think of to recommend that I that I've done recently, and that is All Quiet on the Western Front. Mm. Mm which was uh, the first book I've read for 2021, which I realized as I was closing in on finishing it, and I was like, wow, that is that is not a good sign for the, the, the coming year. <laughs> but it is a very, very bleak story from the perspective of a World War I German infantryman. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like World War I is not understood. And I would put myself in that camp generally speaking, even though I've done a relatively large amount of studying on World War I. Nonetheless, it's good because it, it gives you the perspective of just a random grunt in the field and yeah. what kind of absolute horrors they had to experience in, in this, uh, this conflict. And it's, it's at least worth reading for the historical information of that uh -huh. and the building of this thing called human empathy, <laughs> <laughs> which you definitely, there's, there's moments that grow that. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to add that to my 21 books that I'm planning to read in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> 21 books to read in 21, 88 but. reasons that Jesus is coming <laughs> 20, 2088. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband and cooking buddy. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, if you want to check out any of the resources that we've mentioned or movies that we've alluded to, they're in the show <laughs> notes, which you can find in whatever podcast catcher you're listening on or at our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Send us an email, haltingtowardsiam at gmail.com. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>